We're here every day at Sam Roberts Show. And I do this every day, starting at this time, noon, Eastern Standard Time. If you want to follow along with the show, do it like we do it every day on Twitter. SR Show SXM. Follow SR Show SXM on Twitter. Anytime there's celebrities in here, anytime there's girls in here, we take their pictures without them knowing. We put them on the Twitter. Anytime we talk about articles, videos, we take the links. We put them on the Twitter. You can follow along. You can be an informed listener. If you follow that Twitter, you can also be part of the show. You know how that's done? We're the only radio show in the continental U.S. that's installed a telephone system. Using this telephone system, you can be a part of this show. All you have to do is dial on your home telephone. We also work with cellular phones as of this morning. As of today, we do work with cellular phones as well. Just call 866 866- 969-1969. That's 866-969-1969. Now, a lot to do today. Patrick Warburton is going to be here. You know Patrick. He played Putty on Seinfeld. He was also The Tick. He's done a lot of stuff. He's going to be in Joe Dirt 2, which is on Crackle. And he's going to be in Ted 2, which is in theaters on Friday. So we'll talk to Patrick Warburton in just a little bit, actually, here on Sam Roberts Show. And Katie Linendahl is coming in. You should know Katie Linendahl by now. Tech guru, gadget expert. She's been on the Today Show, CNN, Fox News. She's on this show all the time. So she'll be stopping in today on Sam Roberts' show. I did. A, I had another art house weekend. You remember a couple weeks ago, I came in and I said that I, I'd gone the art house route. I'd gone to the movie theater and I'd walked past everybody that was showing up to see Entourage. I still haven't seen that Entourage movie. But everybody was showing up to see Entourage and I walked past them to watch the Beach Boys movie. And it was me... And like a dozen senior citizens. And I felt very heady. I felt like an intellectual for a moment as I sat there knowing that all my counterparts, all my peers were sitting in there watching what Vinny was up to. What Vinny and Turtle were doing. I didn't know. I had no clue. Because I was educating myself with the Beach Boys movie. I did it again this weekend. 866-969-1969 is the phone number to call Sam Roberts Show this weekend. This weekend wasn't even so much about me. I guess the big movie, I, the big movie again was Jurassic World, which I saw last weekend. I see, I'm not always about the art house movies. Usually, I'm Sammy Popcorn. I'm all about just showing up, going to whatever everybody else is going to see, and predicting every move in the movie as it happens, and leaving somewhat dissatisfied, like women are with me. That was uh, last weekend with Jurassic World. It made another hundred million dollars domestically here in the United States this weekend. It's up to like four hundred million or something like that. Inside Out was the big movie that opened this weekend. That too made almost a hundred million dollars. Uh, I didn't see either of those two things. I felt like I should do something. It was on Father's Day. I'll tell you, maybe we'll get into Father's Day in a little bit. But uh, my wife, who I felt like I should throw a bone to because I've been doing what I my version of work constantly I'm not home very often I'm just working on stuff my definition of work is not like your definition of work my definition of work is this right now what I'm doing is like the height of my work right now what you're doing is actual work right now what I'm doing is like yeah no 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 I got to concentrate on my work for tomorrow, which is just this showing up here and yapping about whatever it was that I did yesterday. That's what I'm focusing and concentrating on. So I felt like, you know, I go to wrestling shows and I say that's work because I have a wrestling podcast. So that's work. You know, I, I take my interests and then I try to figure out some way that I can turn them into work. And then I just do whatever I like all the time. And I tell the people around me, no, I don't have time for you. I have to go to work. Really, you have to go to work. You have to, you're have to. you going to a wrestling show tonight. Yeah, it's work, though. So on Sunday, I was like, all right, we can go do whatever you want to do, Jess. And the movie that she wanted to watch was Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And so we went to see that, and she said, don't worry, Sam. You're going to love this movie. It's going to be... Ju- it, it, they're saying it could be the next Napoleon Dynamite. And I thought to myself, great. Tater tots? Perfect. Love that movie. The chickens have large talons. Can't get enough of it. Bow to your sensei. It goes on and on and on and on. I love Napoleon Dynamite. So I showed up. Little did I know that this movie was not Napoleon Dynamite in the sense of it's funny. 
it was Napoleon Dynamite in the sense of it's kind of it's one of those very expensive indie movies that's going to go mainstream. She might as well have said it's the next Little Miss Sunshine. That would have made a lot more sense to me. I thought it was going to be like a wacky comedy, like oh the girl's not really dying, is she? She's got a fucking elephant hat on or something like that. I don't know something silly, but it wasn't that at all. It wasn't silly at all. You know what I was tricked into seeing? A cancer movie. A cancer movie. There is nothing. There's very little that annoys me more in terms of going to the movies than a cancer movie, especially a kid cancer movie. Because people go and they show up and they end up crying and they talk about how wonderful these movies are when they're not at all. There's no work that's been put into them. There has never been a scenario where a kid, a teenager dying of cancer has not been sad. All you have to do with a cancer movie is write about somebody who's young that has their whole life ahead of them, and then you announce in the beginning of the movie they have cancer, and then in the middle of the movie you shave their head, and then in the end of the movie they die. If you really want to be a tearjerker, you make it a girl, and then you get to talk about, oh, it's so sad because the girl has to shave her head, and all she wants to do is be beautiful, and then she dies. Two movies I can't stand. These are become genres of movies. And everybody buys into them, and I can't understand why. Cancer movies and dog movies. All they do is annoy me. I know as soon as I sit down. See, this one I was tricked into seeing. I didn't know this was a cancer movie before I went to see it. I thought it was like, you know, one of those sort of indie, uh, uh, charming, whatever. It, like that show The New Girl. One of those type of movies. Little did I know, it was simply a cancer movie disguised as a quirky comedy. There was nothing quirky about it. It was annoying, and then the girl died of cancer. I saw a preview right before this movie. It was for the other type of movie I hate. It was a story about a a guy, and he's in the Navy, and he's got his dog. And then, I don't know, he dies or something, but the dog comes home, and the dog hangs out with the little brother, and the little brother doesn't like the dog. But then you see throughout this trailer, the dog and the little brother become best friends. And my wife leans over to me, and she goes, we have to see that, Sam, we have to see that. And I said, Jess, absolutely not. The only thing I like worse than a cancer movie is a dog movie, because a dog movie is exactly the same thing. There's never been a scenario where it's been different. The dog movie, you either meet the movie, you either meet the dog as a puppy, or you, you, you watch the family get it under unforeseen circumstances. There's a period of time where the family and the dog don't get along. Then the dog becomes the most loyal companion you've ever had. Then the dog dies every time. It's the only story there is to be told about a dog. It dies. It's the same way there's only one story to be told about a kid who has cancer. The kid dies. Every single time. And I watch trailers like I've never seen that Marley and Me movie. Because I know, I'm sure, nobody even has to spoil it for me. At the end, the dog is going to die. Me, I understand it's, the movie is called Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. But I didn't realize it was a literal dying girl. I was like, oh, that's probably just one of those quirky titles. No. It was just another cancer movie. It was like the Fault in Our Stars movie. It was, I've never liked a cancer movie. There's not been one good one because they're all the same movie. They're all just using parlor tricks. It's a parlor trick. It's a filmmaker's parlor trick to make people upset, especially women. Caleb, you're on Sam Roberts' show. Caleb, you there? Yeah. All right, well, you're on the show. Hey. Hey. Caleb, you got to do better than that. Let's go to James in North Carolina. It sounded like he was about to pipe up. I don't have time. 866-969-1969 is the phone number to call Sam Roberts Show if you think you could beat Caleb. James in North Carolina. Hey, Sammy Sweetheart, i got to correct you. There is one dog movie you will go see. What's that dog, What's that dog movie? It's called Russell Mania. I know you might have seen the previews for it. Okay, was that one of those? Was that Airbud? Airbud WrestleMania. Yeah, I'll watch that movie because then the dog becomes a wrestler. The dog doesn't die at the end of that one, I'll bet. Uh, I don't know. I just know I do want to do want to put out one thing. Mm-hmm. The uh, last Rocky movie coming out later this year called Creed. Mm-hmm. Yes, Rocky dies in the end. He gets cancer and he dies. Why does every it, it, it happens every time? Thank you, James. 
I don't understand why people want to put themselves through this. And it's like immediately they go, they know what the story is. As soon, the girl caught cancer like 15 minutes into the movie. And I was like, you have to be fucking kidding me. You have to, this is the movie we're seeing? And I'm sitting there and I don't want to ruin it. Because Jess is like engulfed in it, of course. And she's crying and she's getting very emotional about what's going on. And I, 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 the movie had already played out in my head. It was the same thing when I was watching San Andreas, the earthquake movie. But we all acknowledge that the San Andreas earthquake movie is following a cookie cutter format. And it's supposed to, and that's what you go for. These cancer movies, they get treated like they're these art house masterpieces where it's a really, it's an exploration of the human soul. And people go and they have these emotional outpouring and it's uh, what the, what this director has done is just amazing and the writer is really and it's like stop it stop saying that every cancer story is the same the person dies at the end of it and it's very very sad you know why the movie my girl works so well because Macaulay Culkin didn't have cancer he got attacked by bees at the very end and you didn't see that shit coming you were like what Macaulay Culkin's dead from bees. You did not see it coming. If they had said in the beginning of the movie, by the way, Macaulay Culkin has cancer, but he might live, I would tell you immediately, there's no fucking way he's going to live. Because that man, Dan Aykroyd, would not have said that sentence in the beginning of this movie if that had happened. But I didn't know he was going to get attacked by bees. So then when Macaulay Culkin is sitting there at the end of the movie in that tiny little casket, I was like, that's a very sad thing to happen. When a girl gets cancer at the beginning of the movie and then she dies at the end of the movie, it's nothing sad about it. It's obvious and it's and it's it's i feel like a filmmaker is taking advantage of an audience he's he's calling us all suckers he's stealing our movie ticket money god damn it let's go to super fan eric super fan jamie what's up buddy jamie can you hear me yeah can you hear me all right well i can hear you but i didn't hear the click but anyway hey listen baby i got the faintest faintest idea for a movie <laughs> yeah you and me we write the screenplay yeah we get a dog he gets cancer. We have to shave the dog down. Yeah. And it still dies. And it still dies at the end. And they go, you know what? This may be the strongest dog we've ever seen. And then it is strong. And it's strong throughout the whole movie. And you know what happens in the end? It dies. Like every dog and every person with cancer, it dies. Yeah, but we get to shave a dog, Sam. We get to shave the dog. You know what my favorite part of your phone call today is, Superfan Eric? What's that, brother? What's you know, that? I can hear you. you know what my favorite part about this phone call is today? It's with me? No, my favorite part is that I caught you out of character right before you knew you were on the air. Oh, yeah, man. I'm, I'm not out of character. I'm like this all the time. I just right. didn't hear the little, the little click in, man. All right, right buddy. All, fired up all day long. I love the idea. I mean, if I'm going to shave a dog with anybody, it's going to be with you, super fan, Eric. Let's go to Jim in Alabama. What's up, Jim? Yo, Sambo. How you doing? Hey, man. The movie Ape Below. Okay. The, the boss of the the team up there, you know, they do the dog track teams. Mm -hmm. Were they were all killed? But he went up there and he found the boss dog, and it lived throughout the movie. And did it at the and, and at the end of the movie, it was still alive. Yes. This sounds like a fantastic movie. Hey, hello. It's a it's a great movie. And also, I have something else. that's a little bit off subject. I, I wanted to see if you'd go with it. Okay. Okay, the girl with the NAACP thing, uh, you know, fake to be... Rachel Dolezal. As a matter of fact, yeah. coming up later, I promised you on Friday, I'm going to try to squeeze in a song that her ex-fiance uh, wrote and performed for her. That's awesome. Isn't that a long way to go just to say the N-word with a free pass? Look, is it a long way to go? Yes. Is it worth it? Quite possibly. <laughs> let's, go to, uh, let's go to Evan. Evan, you're on the air. Oh, did you hang up? Did you get scared? Burr is this guy's name? Okay, Burr? Beer. Beer is his name, not Burr. Why would you say, mm-hmm, Paul? Beer. Like the drink. B-E-E-R. Like the drink. I like the like drink, drink, Paul. All he wants to do is hear his name on the air, and instead he's got to hear Burr like it's cold in here. There must be some Toros in the atmosphere. What's going on, imagine, Burr? Imagine going through, imagine going through a roll call at school, and with that name on the sheet, I've heard everything. So did you, did you have very white trash parents? Uh, actually, actually, my parents were from India. I'm oh, so it's like, an, it's not like, it's not like, I see, I pictured you as like a child of a southern guy wearing a wife beater with a giant belly, who's just like, let's name him uh, beer, I love beer. 
No, it's like my parents were like, ah, I wish I had a white baby. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I get you. I get you. Um, yeah. So you're talking about these movies here, and I think I know why they make them. It's because it's easy. It is it's so easy, easy, dude. And it. Dreads, I think that's what drives me the most crazy, that I feel like... Unless you're doing a multi-million dollar action movie where it's just like, that's obvious. The only reason the studio is giving you a hundred million dollars to make a movie is because you've promised to follow a formula. And that's what it is. But when you're actually making a movie, like you get actors and a script and you actually make a real movie, to go that fucking lazy, trickery route of just making a cancer movie that you know is going to pull on heartstrings, and you know it's like making Oscar bait. It drives me insane to see. Absolutely, man. And the problem is, too, is it's the same thing with uh, horror movies now. Horror movies don't mean shit anymore because it's just, let's just give this guy a new weapon and a new mask, and uh, let's spend 20 bucks on the movie. And it's, it's, just, it's just so easy now that, and like you were saying before, where people are like, oh, wow, what a... What a deep and brooding director. Go fuck yourself. He's not, he he's not even close to that. He's no, not, and then, is. and then, okay, and then I'm watching this movie, and the girl, spoiler alert, dies at the end. Of course she does. It's a fucking cancer movie. It's not a spoiler. So, I'm watching this movie, and I go, the only thing I'll be even sort of okay with is if this is based on a true story, and it's somebody kind of telling their story, and I would go, okay, I didn't enjoy it, but I'll at least accept that you had to tell your story. The movie is based on a novel. Some asshole decided to write a work of fiction where some teenage girl just gets cancer and dies. Why would you write that in a novel? Exactly. I want to see, I want to see a cancer movie where she gets some different treatment or something like that and it turns into a fucking cyborg and starts killing people. That shit... That'd be, will be off the chain. That'd be fucking awesome. The whole time I'm sitting there and I have my cheek on my fist... With my eyes rolling, and I'm going, I'm waiting until the end of this movie, because there better be a fucking twist or something that makes this different from just a cancer movie, and there is nothing, nothing that makes me and Earl and the Dying Girl any different than any cancer movie that's ever existed. It's all the trickery you would expect. It's too, it's too much business, right? So it's like, they know, they know that... Uh We'll, we'll, like uh, the audience will associate with any. You can make them fall in love with any character. It's like Game of Thrones, where they make you fall in love with a character, and then they fuck you by killing that character. It's like, oh shit! Yeah, oh. they got it. They got everybody good in the finale. All right, beer. I appreciate the call. Yeah, you got it. Man. All right, buddy. Let's go to Alex in Arizona. What's going on, Alex? Hey, Sammy. Uh, we got a classic, kid classic, Homeward Bound and Beethoven, bud. See, I like it, I, but. I gotta imagine that one of those sequels, Beethoven must have died. Because didn't they go up to like Beethoven's fifth or something like that? He had to be dead by then. Those dogs are giant. They don't live that long. That's true. That's true. But, I mean, you had three dogs in Homeward Bound. They all lived. And I'm sure, you know, however however many huge St. Bernards and... Uh, in, in Beethoven. So, yeah, I wish they would make more movies like... Whatever it was. Yeah, I wish they would make more movies like Homeward Bound because the animals don't die and they all talk to each other. They're all good friends. It makes me feel good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing about that horror thing that like I was talking about, um, I think the, the thriller movies like uh, I Spit on Your Grave and uh, uh, movies of the like where the character, you think they died, but that they come back and just fuck shit up. Yeah. That... That's uh, that's starting to make its make its way in, and and just uh, sl the the super gruesome uh, hostile type horror movies, which are pretty fucking cool, uh, are, are are starting to phase out. I guess. Uh, yeah. What do you think? I think that's right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I think that with the horror movies, what had happened was the same thing that happened with reality TV. You know, they they made Saw, and they made it super cheap, and it made you know a billion dollars or whatever. And so they were like, oh, we should just make eight of these. And then they made Hostel, and they made a ton of these movies where it was like, okay, we can just make the goriest things you've ever seen, spend no money on it, release it, you know, three times a year, and make millions and millions and millions of dollars. So they figured out that formula, and they did it for a while, and we got a lot of shit, and a lot of good movies. I like the Hostel movies, and I like the... I, I gotta tell you something. I went to see every single Saw movie in theaters, but... It ended up being a thing where they just started making gore porn with no actors and no money put into it whatsoever. Then I think what's going on now is they've done they're doing a lot more bump in the night 
scary movies, like uh, like the insidious type of movies, and the with the jerky camera movements. They're going back to like the ring style of stuff, where there's more startling, and there's ghosts, and there's all that. You know what I mean? I'm getting a text uh, from Justin Stangle. He's saying Turner and Hooch. Wait, I believe they both died. Yes, if I'm not mistaken, both Tom Hanks and that slobbering dog are very much deceased. It was either that or Philadelphia. Let's go to Larry. What's going on, Larry? Well, Sammy, Sammy Popcorn, the professional broadcaster and the watcher of popular movies to save us the trouble. That's right. Don't see that fucking gonna... cancer movie. Well, I was going to go for a Stripes callback about Old Yeller, but I thought how played and how, you know, hack. So I'm just going to say that the people continue to make the formulaic stuff because it continues to sell. It continues to make money. And they're not making any art because there really is nothing original anymore, really. No, they're, you're just, right. Okay, let's just... It's just like they figured out what works, and they're just going to keep doing that. I'm going to tell you, because you were asking about Old Yeller, but decided not to. I'm too young. I, didn't, I, I think I saw Old Yeller. I don't really remember. But you know when I got? I got tricked by the animal thing once. And it was an inappropriate time to get tricked, and it proved what a little pussy boy I was. My dad could not have been proud of me. When I was in probably either, I was probably second grade, I read the book Super Fudge. It's about a boy and his brother. Anybody ever read that book Super Fudge? Yeah, it was, a, it was a very popular book at the time. So I read that book, and the boy had a turtle in the book, and his little brother was named Super Fudge, and his little brother was a was a fucking animal. His little brother was a was a was a very difficult to deal with child. So at the end of the book, Super Fudge eats the turtle, eats the turtle. This this little kid eats the turtle. So then they got to rush the little kid to the hospital to save him. And then it turns out that, you know, the big brother gets worried about his little brother and everybody lives happily ever after. But I'm reading the book, and I swear to you, I remember it. I was in second grade, and I walked down the stairs bawling my eyes out. I was crying. You know why? Because the turtle died. Because Super Fudge ate the turtle. And everybody was so concentrating on saving this little kid that nobody worried about the fact that there was a dead turtle in his stomach. A turtle's not going to survive getting eaten by a five-year-old. It'll never happen. That was a cheap trick. I fell for it. And from that point on, I said, never again. I don't want this in my life. These are cheap parlor tricks done by people masquer masquerading as artists. They're, uh, they're bastardizing all their professions, filmmaking, writing, whatever it is. And I want nothing, nothing to do with it. And so from now on, I don't. From that point on. At the age of seven, I'd had enough. Let's go to Evan. Evan, you're on Sam Roberts' show. No, what up, Sam? How you doing? Not bad. You ever see that movie 5050 with Joseph Gordon-Levitt? I did. He's still alive and kicking. Yeah, I like that. And I, I mean, here's the thing. I like Joseph, Gord Joseph Gordon-Levitt and like Seth, like Seth Rogen. I like that he's still alive. I didn't like that the movie was about cancer. I got very annoyed by it. I like everything yeah. else they've done. But I got very, very annoyed by the 5050 movie. I've never watched it again after I watched it the first time. Yeah, I hear you. On a side note, you should have an, a cook-off between Action Bronson and Guy Fieri. Action Bronson make would fucking mop Fieri. the floor with him. Yeah, make fun of that clown. I will. Thank you very much, Evan. Action Bronson would destroy him. Brian, uh, Brandon, you're on Sam Roberts' show. Hey, Sam. Uh, I got a good idea for a movie, okay? It's got everything. Okay. And it'll be fun at the end, okay? Okay. Dog and girl have cancer. They meet during chemo. Okay, so the dog is getting... They, see, this is already hilarious to me, because I am already picturing a hospital room, uh, or a hospice, or wherever they go, and it's uh, the, the girl is plugged into the chemotherapy machine, and she's got the needle in her arm, and then sitting next to her is a dog in a person chair with a needle in its arm getting chemotherapy as well. So the dog and the girl are both getting chemo. Right, and they get well together, okay. and they become friends, and she adopts them. But then the dog gets rabies. <laughs> right. And then... And they have to put him down. But then, no, 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 then, Brandon. At the Br end, is this all a dream? Here's, the no, whole no. movie was just a dream and she wakes up. And Brandon, I have one better for you. Okay. Here's what we do. We go, I like so far, they meet in chemotherapy, they both get better together, the dog does get rabies. But you know what happens? What? We don't want the dog to be put down. The girl speaks for the audience. So the girl grabs the dog right around the neck and gives him a big hug and says, No, no, I don't want to put Fido down. And you know what Fido does? 
he rips her throat out with his teeth because he's got rabies <laughs> and he kills the girl. And then you know what happens? What? The dog wakes up and it was all the dog's malicious, the dog murderous the dream. The dog was dreaming oh. about having cancer and killing a girl. I would watch that movie. It's perfect, perfect. I'm going to try to get Lloyd Kaufman on the phone and sell it to him from Troma Movie. I think he'd make that movie. Uh, write that down, Paul. Write down my movie idea. Dog gets cancer. Girl gets cancer. They get better. Dog gets rabies. Dog kills girl. Dog wakes up. It was a dog's dream. And then text comes up on the screen that says, I guess it really is. A dog-eat-dog world. You got all that? Yep. Okay, write a script for me. Let's go to Parker. What's going on, Parker? What's up, Sam Roberts? How you doing, man? Good. Um, I was just going to bring up, there's one dog movie that I think you might like. It's What's that? Called White, it's called White God. White it's God? About, White God. I know. It sounds weird. It sounds just right, if you ask me. <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> This dog gets left in an alley. He's a mutt. He's trying to survive. Leads an army of other dogs, and they attack one city, and they go nuts like an army. That sounds fucking great. Do they win? Got like a, they all, you'll see what happens. I don't want to ruin it for you. It's got like a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's no called, joke. It's legit as fuck. It's called White God? White God. I'm going to watch that movie. Is it on Netflix? Uh, no. I'm going to buy it on Amazon, then. It's a, a bunch of dogs attack a town? You just watched the trailer, man. Don't All right. play it on the radio, but watch the trailer. All right, I'll watch it tonight, and I'll talk about it tomorrow. Mr. Roberts, it was a pleasure. Yeah, you bet it was. Let's go to George. What's going on, George? Hello, Sam. I just wanted to warn you and your, and your uh, millions of listeners. Uh, there's a, a movie called uh, Bridge to Terabithia. I got a young son, and I'm always trying to find movies that he can watch, sure. you know, that are uh, not, uh, you know, too bad or language or anything like that. And this movie's got these kids in it, and they become friends, and they have this little fantasy world across this bridge. And I thought this had to be a great movie. Well, halfway through the movie, the girl gets killed. It's a horrible movie. Why do they do that? Just do a nice movie or do a cool movie. Either nice or cool. It doesn't always have to be pull at the heartstrings. And, and I don't mind a movie that's actually sad and plays on human emotion and blah, blah, blah. But it, this is emotion porn. It's like gore porn. Like in horror movies when they just have gore for the sake of gore, like it's just stabbing and stabbing and stabbing and, and, and screwdrivers in the eyeballs and whatnot. I don't think that that's creative. It's just gore for the sake of gore. This is that, except for emotions. This is the lady version of that. Guys go and they watch Freddy Krueger slash shit up and love it. Understand it. I guess this is the girl version of that. Girls go, and they just get presented with things that are universally sad in any situation, and then they cry, and then they feel better about themselves. Brian, you're on the air. Hey, Sam. Uh, yeah, I got a, uh, a dog movie for you, man. Yeah? Uh, it's a little-known dog movie called uh, Ghost Dog. It's with Forrest Whitaker. Oh, I know that movie. <laughs> yeah, he plays it. Plays this really big uh, Rottweiler that looks like a human. He, this uh, Rottweiler looks like uh, Forrest Whitaker, and he goes out and he's like a hitman, you know. And uh, uh, the cool. RZA comes out and he plays like a, a Doberman or something. Yeah, I think that like I think Ghost Dog. Cameo. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. And Forrest Whitaker goes out and he like whacks all these uh, uh, guineas, all these uh, mafioso dudes, you know. It's a pretty good dog movie. I think I think uh, Ghost Dog might be the greatest of all dog movies. Let's go to Frank. What's going on, Frank? What's up, guys? How you doing? Sammy, I was thinking about they meet at the, the dog and the chick meet at the cancer place, right? Yes. But then next to them is another guy dog and, 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 and the chick, another guy. And then the next thing you know, the dog is fucking the guy and the, do, the, the girl's fucking the dog. And they all die of rabies. And then the dog wakes up dreaming, but it was really the girl dreaming of the dog dreaming. Okay, that's not a bad idea. Like, the, like the, so there's a second wake up at the end where the dog wakes up. Here's what happens. Okay, and then she, and then she gets up and she's like, 
That's and it's actually like, holy shit, Scooby to the house. That's actually very, very good. I appreciate that, Frank. Maybe the dog wakes up and then gets run over and then the girl wakes up and you realize that it was all the girl's fucked up dream. We gotta we gotta work out the kinks a little bit, punch it up a little bit. Uh Matt in Boston. Hey Sam, how you doing? First time I'm calling your show, I gotta tell you, I love what you're doing. You're doing a great job, brother. Thanks, pal. All right, so first, bridge the tower. Good, I appreciate that, Frank. Maybe the dog wakes up and then gets run over and then the girl wakes up and you realize that it was all the girl's fucked up dream. We gotta we gotta work out the kinks a little bit, punch it up a little bit. Uh Matt in Boston. Hey Sam, how you doing? First time I'm calling your show, I gotta tell you, I love what you're doing. You're doing a great job, brother. Thanks, pal. All right, so first, bridge the tower of Yeah. If you have kids, don't let them see it. The the bridge to Tower of was a rope swing, and the girl dies because she goes, swings across, the rope breaks, and she bashes her head in the stream and drowns. My kids are afraid of rope swings now. What the fuck? Why would you make that movie? Yes, exactly. Like, what good does that do? That oh, An entire generation was afraid to play with deers because they all got shot, thanks to Bambi. You know? I mean, it's like kids growing up today... They are afraid of balloons because they saw that movie up and the way it began. I don't understand why we have to instill these negative views. Go on, go on, go on, man. All right. So anyway, the, and the other thing about the dog movie, the best dog movie was Silverado. Remember that movie with Kevin Klein and Brian Denny? No. Well, we never meet the damn dog. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Kevin Klein gets, uh, gets caught because he tries to save this dog that's injured, and Brian Danny's busting his chops and saying, oh, how's the dog? And the dog left him. That's all the reference to the dog. It's the best dog movie ever. Perfect. You don't get emotionally attached. Everything moves on. Everything's fine. John, you're on Sam Roberts' show. Sam, what's up, buddy? It's Hi. a uh, pleasure to have you talk to me. How are you? It's a pleasure so for you, I'm sure. <laughs> you got that one, huh? <laughs> so, uh... You know what's fucked up? What? Yeah, but these kids, they get, like, this idea in their head that they're going to grow up and be this big boy. Your phone's crapping out, dude. I'm not fucking around. Your Call back. Your phone started shitting out. Uh, Duggan? Dugan? Duggan? Dugan? Dugan. What's up? Dugan. Hey, Sammy. Professional hey. broadcaster. It's, uh, That's right. It's, uh, pleasure is all mine. That's right. Um... Hey, uh, you know that, that that guy called about the the dog and the girl. Yeah. Well, it's not a dog. It's dog the bounty hunter. Oh that's shit! That's what we do. That's what we do. Okay, that's a great idea. Make sure, Paul, in your notes, you write that when the dog wakes up, it's not an actual dog waking up. It dog the bounty hunter wakes up, and the entire movie was dog the bounty hunter's dream. Okay, because that makes sense. Because that is the type of dreams that that weirdo has. Dennis, you're on Sam Roberts' show. Hey, now, I got an idea. Like, Bruce, the Blues Brothers meet uh, Chief and Chong. Mm -hmm. All the aliens meet Ted the Bear. Sam Roberts' show. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm, I'm with it. Let's go to Brian. What's up, Brian? I don't know what he's talking about. Let's go. What's up, Brian? <laughs> hey, what's up, Sam? Yeah, I got another uh, dog movie for you, man. It's uh, probably one of the greatest dog movies ever. It's called uh, Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. He plays like this... Uh, this mangy mutt that's like a, a war veteran. He holds up a bank and he's like, he's not sure if he's gay or if he's straight, but he's got like a... <laughs> he uh, just humps other dogs. Whatever dog, yeah, he'll just Fredo, hump him. Fredo, no, Fredo's in it too and he plays like this, uh, this uh, chihuahua. Fredo's in it and he dies at the end. Yeah, but that's my problem. The dog dies at the end. Yeah, I know. It's, I know. A, it's a bummer, but, uh, dude. But uh, Al Pacino didn't die though. No, it's a great, it's a, it is a great dog movie and if anybody yeah. can pull off a dog, it's Al Pacino. Um, Sean, yeah, um, you know, I really think in the age of uh, remakes and reboots, they need to remake Man's Best Friend. Did you ever see that one? I did not. That's the one where um, it's Lance Henriksen, and there's a dog that's being genetically altered to where it has the DNA of, like, all sorts of other animals. And, that sounds uh, fucking wild. badass. Yeah, it's badass. <laughs> all right, buddy, I'll talk to you later. Mike, Mike, you're on Sam Roberts' show, and I'm pissed off about dog movies and cancer movies. How you doing, Sammy Brand Muffins? I'm all right. All things uh, considered, I'm okay. If you want to spoil every movie that's out there, there's a website called DoesTheDogDie.com. Oh, thank God. The, that that website is doing God's work. It's It really is God's work. You can go on there, check any movie you want, and it, it, and it, they don't even... They don't even discriminate. It's all animals, any any kind of family pet or, or whatnot. Because who wants to see a movie where the animal dies? I've never been sad. I've never, I've never gone to a movie and been glad that the animal dies. 
I've never gone to a movie and been glad that somebody has cancer. Like, oh, I'm glad they put that person with cancer in that movie. It's never happened. Well, you know, Cujo kind of decided, you know, deserved to die there at the end. I mean, no, through no fault of his own. He had rabies. Exactly. It was through no fault of his own, as a matter of fact. I wish he'd gone yeah, into yeah. some kind of treatment damn center. Bat that bit him. I didn't even okay. want the pet cemetery pets to die again. I wanted the pet cemetery pets, once they got out of the tombstones, to live forever. But, you know, maybe I'm just a softy. Oh, we could go on this dog thing forever. Ryan, what's going on? Hey, Ryan. How you doing, Sam? How you doing, buddy? I can't complain, buddy. You're leaving out a great 70s post-apocalyptic film called A Boy and His Dog, starring Don Johnson. Hmm. In the end, they cannibalize a girl. I love that. I'll check that movie out every time. Um, all right, look, enough with the dog movies, enough with the cancer movies. All I'm saying is I got so pissed off. I was heated leaving that movie after seeing me and, and Earl and the dying girl because it was just another kid has cancer movie. All the, the, And it's a new trend. They just had one, like last summer, The Fault in the Stars. That was a kid has cancer movie. I did not go see that movie because they made it very clear on the trailers. This is a kid has cancer movie. I'm not going to see that movie. I have no interest. I didn't know me and the dying girl, even though it's called that, was a cancer movie. But I'm here on Sam Roberts show to let you know that that's exactly what it was. Now, I'm going to take a brief pause. I appreciate all the calls. Again, phone lines are still lit up, but uh, I don't want to talk about dog movies anymore because... Patrick Warburton is on his way in here. You know Patrick. You know him as Putty from Seinfeld. You know him as The Tick from The Tick. And apparently I've read that The Tick is coming back. So we'll talk to him about The Tick coming back. We'll talk to him about being in Ted 2. We'll talk to him about being in Joe Dirt 2. He's a really, really interesting guy. So I'm really looking forward to having him on. When we get back, Patrick Warburton here on Sam Roberts Show. It's Sam Roberts Show. Everybody is very, very excited. I don't know. Who is that? Everybody's very excited about the man who's in studio with me right now. You may know him as The Tick. You may know him as David Putty. You'll see him in Joe Dirt 2, in Ted 2. Joe yeah. Dirt <laughs> Dear Ted. Dear Ted. Put the E on the end. It's kind of cool. Patrick yeah. Warburton is here. What's up, man? Wow, I'm just sort of on a whirlwind tour right now, Sam. Are you? Well, I went to Memphis for a few days, and then I went to D.C. for a week with uh, my wife and two of my boys. So we just spent the last week there in D.C. That was a vacation. That was a vacation. Okay. And then we, uh, now I'm going to be in town here for a week, and then I go to the Congo for nine days. What are you going to the Congo for? There's this group called Starkey. And uh, if you look him up online, there, there's this uh, fellow. His name is Bill Austin and his wife Tanny, and he's a like a billionaire who owns this hearing aid company for years. And he's, did he invent the hearing aid? Uh, he is, uh, you know, he's worked on and invented some of these uh, hearing aids, and uh, um, but he he's, he's a, the main producer of them. And for decades now, he's been traveling the world, uh, putting hearing aids on. Uh, people in, in, in countries all over the world, the worst, worst places. So he'll go into Palestine and get the Israelis and the Palestinians together. They literally will put it aside because he puts on hearing aids. And is he just one of these guys that's like, he's an adventurer at heart. Like he just wants to do shit that nobody would do. So he figures out a way to make his billions and then he can go and, and do this. And he's no. got a reason to be. <laughs> no, no, this is something, this is actually very different than that because he spends 10 months. He's probably in his mid seventies. Wow. He spends 10 months out of the year going to the worst places and he's not traveling he's not having fun i mean he 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 does it because to him for him it's fulfilling but he'll take a group of maybe you know uh 12 people with him into a place like the congo for eight days mm -hmm. and over that period of time they'll put hearing aids free hearing aids on somewhere between four and five thousand children so he's literally uh, just... not children, adults alike uh you know everybody who's who's you know um uh, uh, deaf in this country and has hearing issues. And he's just getting off on helping people. Just getting off on helping That's people. what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. Wow. So over the co course of the last few, few decades, he's actually just, you know, he himself with a group of people has put hearing aids on over about half a million people. Wow. Yeah. And you're going with him. Yeah. So what he'll do is he'll take a group of people, um, uh, you know, with him. They, t they teach you how to test, for, test the hearing and then cut and put the hearing aids on. And then you do that. You get to do that all day. So 
you know, for dipshit like me, I get to feel like a doctor and a humanitarian. Right. Always, you, you get know, to so save yeah. people. Yes. It's uh, like I'm not just performing. Now I'm actually right. I'm making doing a something. difference. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, you know, one of those like actors who just kid yourself into, well, you yes. know what? Yes. A lot of sad people watch what I do and it makes them happy. I really yeah. do. I make a That's difference. Right. <laughs> My father is a, was a surgeon, and his father is a surgeon, and his mother is a nurse. So, it's it's not really very often where I get to feel like I'm doing something useful. So right. you've actually seen yes. your family literally yes. help people and save their lives. But uh, the the you know Bill and Tanya are the two most remarkable people I've I've ever met in my life, and uh, uh, what they've been doing, you know, what they do with their lives, you know, because you could if you had a billion dollars, it'd be really easy just to. Uh, jet around and hang out and yeah go just to, buy an island put a house on it sure yeah hang out at some beach in france do yeah, whatever you know but that's not what they've done with their lives and um i think it's it's even harder when you have those kind of resources and uh, just to do anything you want to just say just dedicate almost every day of their life to uh, have you done it people have you done a trip like this before I've just helped them out in Mexico a little bit, but I've never, I haven't gone uh, out to the Congo or something. Like no, that. no. So and I, you not have people... I had to get a bunch of stupid shots and, um, take a bunch of pills. Yeah. yeah and you don't bring your family with you on, on a no. trip like this. Uh-uh. No. So is that the deal? Like, you're like, look, we're all going to go. We're going to spend some time in DC. I'm going to yeah. vacation with yeah. you. You have to like allocate time like that because I have work. Yeah. I have my hearing aid thing that I love That's to right. do. And I have my family. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I have to figure out how to balance it all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, everything just kind of got jammed together this summer, but DC was great. I have a son who's 17 and he, he bleeds red, white, and blue and he wants to go in the Navy. His uh, cousin is at Annapolis right now. So we visited him. Oh, wow. And, um, so, uh, we had a, we had a lot of cool meetings in DC. We got to go to the Pentagon and we met some admirals and generals and, and you, you could, do you get special access in places and stuff like that? Uh, certain ones it's, it's not because, uh, you know, uh, I'm a dumb TV actor just because what we, one, we have an admiral in the family, right? You can't wear the eight ball jacket and yeah. just show up, yeah, like, you know, like, you know, listen, the deal. maybe you saw me a little show called Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah. We'd like to have access to yeah. this. No, we want to see the president's bedroom. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was on a little show called Dave's world. With yeah. Her, so maybe you heard of it. <laughs> Um, you wear the full tick outfit. You go, no, yes. that's me. Right. I'm the guy. Yeah. Hello, superhero. <laughs> yeah, no. 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 Uh, well, we did get to go to the White House. That was cool. Yeah. yeah. So how do you feel about your kid joining the Navy? As, as long as he goes the officer route, that's good. You know? Yeah. I think when you're 17 and you see what's going on in the world and you want to make a difference, there's a, a and you're, you're physical like he is, you know, and, um, uh, you know, you want to, be a tip of the spear guy, and I'm not crazy about that. So yeah, because you got to be like on one end, you're proud of your son, supporting his country, he wants to actually do something. He's not because most 17 year olds, yeah, they have no ambition whatsoever, let alone ambition yeah. to actually go and join the navy and do something arduous like that and honorable. Right. But at the same time, you're like, that's my kid. Yeah, I don't want to see him. You know, no, put himself in any danger whatsoever. No, no. No, I, I can't I can't imagine uh, any of my children purposely, you know, uh, especially being in, in harm's way. But I understand his. Um, uh, I know him. I know his his passion. I know his um, goodness, and he he's always um, had a real sense of you know like you know what's right and what's wrong and and you know we we have a giant flagpole out in front of our house that mm-hmm. he, he made us put up there and. Um, doesn't matter how early we're out in the morning, uh, if there's any reason at all for that flag to be half mast, it will be. You know, he's just he, first thing in the morning. He's just uh, he's. Has he always been that way? When did he start? Kind of. You know, we um, we live near the uh, the Reagan Library, uh-huh. and that's always been his favorite place to to go. And and of course, uh, you know, he's he's. Uh, huge fan of the former POTUS there because uh too when you go there you see the big bronze statue and you walk through the reagan library and you see the movies they've got an old movie theater where they're showing him you know as the right and then the next scene you walk over and uh tear down this wall and uh, you know, <laughs> so as a kid he's going there and looking at him like a superhero yeah absolutely yeah. and uh and of course reagan was one of those presidents who just was you know bigger than life that way and right. you um um and uh 
was just a no bullshit guy. You know, you yeah. really, you really did have this, this, this sense that. Uh, did you ever lean down to your son and say, you know, before he was president, yeah. Ronald Reagan was an actor, yeah, not unlike someone you know. He did a few B movies like your father. <laughs> That's right. Um, he had uh, uh, his best friend uh, lived at the base of the mountain where the Reagan Library is, and he and his buddy and his dad would uh, hike up there regularly. You know, and then. Uh, then, uh, when he was only nine years old, he died. He had a terrible accident. Oh, yeah. He, Jesus. Yeah. Um, they were, you know, they're doing an, a, a, an ad on at their house and, uh, he went upstairs where he wasn't supposed to and he fell through the roof and, um, he was at our house one day and he was gone the next day. Wow. It was just, you know, devastating for Shane. Yeah. He's this nine year old. He's got a process like this doesn't happen for right. nine year olds, you know, no. especially when there's no, reason like there's no lesson to be learned there's no, no sort of anything yeah. to it it just yeah. yeah yeah and his name was lucas and um it was the hardest thing that any of us in our family have ever been through um, yeah i mean um kathy and myself we just you know for a month just uh you know just every day for a month we were just you just find yourself uh in tears because it, it was just overwhelming and to see shane suffer like this it's helped make him who he is you know uh, it seems of, it seems like one of those things that you have to kind of launch into adulthood pretty early. Like yeah. you have to you have to yeah. really gain a lot of maturity to kind of process that at nine. At nine, yeah. you know what I mean. Like mortality and everything mm -hmm. starts to become a real thing. Yeah. So he's always been an you know kind of an old soul, right? And uh, I think mortality is something he's been in touch with, you know, from an earlier age, and you know it was a real is a reality to him. Mm -hmm. It's not to most children, I, I don't think. Right. And you're invincible until you're like 16, 17 years old, you know, yeah. and even then it's like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to be yeah. young forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you got a 17 year old kid who's like, dad, there are worse things than death. Like, go get <laughs> yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hoorah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tough son of a bitch. Are you guys, are you a political guy? Uh, not so much, you know. Yeah. I try to keep my opinions close to the vest. <laughs> if you're trade games, if you're trying to, if I don't know. Over, you know, Sam, if you, I don't talk about anything there anymore because it's so polarizing. But um, yeah, it really is, especially in Hollywood. Yeah. Does yeah. that is that just do you think polarizing in terms of an audience will start to look at you differently, or do you think it's casting people and producers and all those people are like, oh well, no, he's a supporter. Well, no, because I have Z. no, and I have my own opinions, and then my opinions change. You know, I find myself to be generally right. fiscally conservative, but in other other areas, you know, uh, much more liberal. I grew up in a very conservative. I grew up in Orange County, you know, Huntington Beach, Orange County, very mm -hmm. very Republican area, and so I've sort of you know, although um, I tend to be, um, like I said, fiscally conservative, I. Very, very uh, much more um, liberal in, in certain other areas. Um, it, it, you know, my parents are <laughs> my parents are sort of like uh, they're they're what I call religious crazy. <laughs> my, um, you know, my dad was in the monastery for three months. Wow, almost became a monk before he decided that medicine was his calling. And then my mother, wow, went to, went to school with the nuns, but she was an actress. But there were things that she wouldn't do as an actress, and she quit the industry and. Had kids, so uh, you know, uh, she 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 didn't work professionally, you know, while raising a family. Um, but it, I mean, I just visited him just recently, you know, and and my dad's not doing well, and I came home I, like one night we went out with uh, some friends down there in Florida, and my buddy wanted to go out and get another drink and have a cigar afterwards. I said, listen, I I don't see my parents much. I'm going to go home, mm -hmm. put my dad to bed, and then my mom and I'll hang out, and so. That's exactly what I did. Well, my mom turns on the Catholic channel, and there's an old nun about 90 years old that does the rosary, and she just looked at me, and she said, I'm just asking that you do one decade of the rosary with me. That's all I'm asking. Decade. De a decade, yeah. And I go, you know, I, I didn't say anything. I was fine. So I, I, you know, I sat there with my mom while this old nun on TV yeah. for a decade, and then at, my mom's real sneaky. Then after, after that first decade, then my mom just um, very quietly, she leans over to me, and she goes, now the second decade, and I go no, that, <laughs> yeah. I go, mom, that's it. I'm not going to do a two martini television rosary right now with you, which I'm sure words are have never been spoken. <laughs> yeah. I'm the first person in history to ever say that. I'm not doing a two martini rosary rosary television rosary with you right now. 
But that's my parents are. My parents are very, very religious. And they, she probably figured that after you do the first decade, it's like, okay, I'll convince him to do the first yeah. one, but he'll realize how good it is, yeah. and he'll want to keep going. Yes, yes. It's the rosary is what's going to save the world. I don't think the rosary is going to save the world, Mom. <laughs> yeah. I don't believe what you believe. Yeah. I, I'm not anti-prayer, and I'm not anti-faith, but I... I I, I, you know, that it's, um, you know, we, it's just the generation, generational thing. But when you talk about conservatives and Republicans and the way that, you know, I, I, you know, my mom loves the gays. She wants to, but she still wants to be able to save them, to change them, you know. Right. Like she doesn't, she doesn't get, yeah. That's they so interesting. So she doesn't choice. have an ounce of hatred in her for no. any gay people. No. But, but she wants them to go to heaven, which right. means. Yes. We have yeah, to save them. Right. And so then in, wow. try, in trying to explain, and it's impossible to explain that, you know, you're the root of the problem here. Right. You know, when because she's got good intentions. You're, uh, yeah. But you're, you, but the problem is, yeah. And when you talk about the road to hell being paved with good intentions, I believe that this is like one of those situations. When you look at like the fact that gay teen suicide rate is four times higher than the regular teen suicide rate. Yeah. And these children who go to school, you know, there are other kids at that school who, have parents like that yeah. who say things like this, and then these kids say, "You're not, you're going to hell because you're gay or whatever." See, that's the root of the problem. Absolutely. And so uh, that's very, very, you know, becomes very, very frustrating. But it's interesting for you to see it from a perspective because I've, you know, you've heard that story a hundred times, but you've yeah. never really heard empathy for the person that doesn't have negative intentions and doesn't think that what they're doing is going to cause people to kill themselves. Right. It does. It does. But having to explain that to an older woman, yeah, it's got to be impossible. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I I never get anywhere with her. Right. She's filed. She's filed um, official complaints to get the uh, to the FCC to get Family Guy off the air. You're on the show. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. that's how you make your your yes. money. That's yes. how you feed your family. Yes. 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 Oh, that's how I help mom and dad out. Right. By the that's way, how right you, now. Yeah. Yeah. You, your dad's not doing well, well and, yeah. you, and you pay for that. Yeah. Making yeah. sure that he's as comfortable as he can yeah. be. It, yeah, it is a, it, a show that she's trying to have canceled. Yeah, there's yes. a little bit of irony there that uh, the actor's son is help, helping them financially, the doctor. But, you know, my dad, God love him, he, he's a good good man, a good doctor. We'll go down to Mexico and help the kids with polio and all that stuff, you uh -huh. know. Good doctor with good ethics, you know. But, um, it had, you know, a lot of doctors had a rough time. I've had a rough time the last couple of decades, you know, when you talk about overhead and malpractice insurance and this and sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. And medicine's gone in. You always feel like a doctor would just be fine and uh, well, well off in retirement, and they're not. You know, he's not. You know, and he's been a doctor all his life. Yeah. Wow. So, what did your mom have a problem with specifically on Family Guy that was so bad that she had to oh, contact the FCC? Just the the oh, it's or is the it just the it's general. Like, it's the general show. It's the whole thing. <laughs> just that it exists yeah. at all. I, my dad called me one time and left a message on my phone, and this is all he said, verbatim. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a future, and he doesn't know this, by the way, too. Sam. He doesn't. He hasn't watched the show. But they through their, you know, their <laughs> groups, they find out. You know, they get scripts and writings. You know, they get. They've got their inside information. Sure. Of what you know, the the devil's going to say on TV next week. They would never stop and watch it. No. Even if their son was on it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And even if they did, it wouldn't help Sam. No. It would not help. No. So uh, my dad just calls up. And he says, "Um, in a future episode of The Family Guy, God is sitting in a lazy boy chair." Next to a bottle of lotion, getting ready to masturbate. <laughs> I wish you would get off that show. <laughs> he is at the point of being emotional because I have spit in God's face. You know what I'm saying? It's right. Like, you know, and I want to go look, Dad. God is not an old guy like you with a beard sitting on a lazy boy chair. It's called satire. And right. I just, it's just made such a mess with the family. I've literally I had my mom cry. My dad cry. They really, it's really, really, really at, horrible. At any point, have you thought like I can't do this anymore? Like I like. Was there at any point in your life a time where your parents' viewpoints would shape what you do? Obviously, you're not there now. No, but no. But, but was there a point when when they when you'd be like, you know what? I don't want to disappoint my parents. I can't do this. It gets to you because there's a part of us that that is you know where we see things rationally. We we get it. We can recognize you know like um the, you know fear based you know a lot of the fear in religion. Yeah, and all that stuff you know. But when your mother your mother is saying things like. You know, dear, eternity is a long time. You know, then you start, well, what, the, what the fuck? What is right. she right? And then it's got to question everything she's ever said right. to you growing up as a kid. Like right. all the rules of the house. Yes. The, the, the wisdom, the life lessons, everything. You're like, that's all based on that thing. Sure. It's not right. true. Right. 
That's not real. That's not real. Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. So yeah. You're sitting there going like, well, at this point, I'm not really going to let any of that dictate anything I do. I can't. Right. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. when did you get there, though? I like, know. And I'm 50 years old. I feel like, I, you know, at this point, I mean, I shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be about rebellion anymore. <laughs> I, I don't think it is. I think it's just about good common sense. I still I can't imagine that, you know, I'll spend the rest of eternity in the fires of hell just going, gosh, damn it. I. <laughs> Why did I listen to Seth MacFarlane? That Seth guy. He's yeah, they were right about the, the jerk off cartoon. That That's was the right. one that was thing the that one. pushed it. That's right. God said, "Yeah." When I sat up there, he said, "Well, listen, you were oh, right on the fence with you, Warburton. Right on the fence." Well, what uh, did your but, mom say though when you first got involved in acting? Because she was involved in acting and quit specifically because of religion and family, and then she raises a son yeah. who gets involved in acting. Yeah. So was your mom saying, like, this is not a good road for you to go down? No, she never did, but she was just always disappointed. She if, was. Oh, yeah. If, if it wasn't, you know, uh, Little House on the Prairie or The Wonderful World of Disney, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And she hates it when I play gay characters. She <laughs> oh, hates I would imagine. It. <laughs> she does yeah. not like that one bit. Mom, go see Ted, too. Go see it. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say with Ted, too. Yeah. They can't, I, I'm, they're probably not aware, yeah. but the fact that there's, Teddy bear masturbation jokes yeah. on every poster yeah. and every subway station <laughs> across, like on the city streets of New York. It just says Ted is coming yeah. again yeah. with a bottle of lotion, <laughs> a bottle of lotion that follows you wherever you go. It's perfect. They can't enjoy that. Be yeah, smirching yeah. the image of a teddy bear. No, <laughs> no. Oh, have, what have the, what have you God. done that they've liked? Um, did they like Seinfeld? Seinfeld wasn't. I well, they had the. Well, that had to, thing. that yeah, that had to grow on them. See, the very first time I did an episode of Seinfeld, yeah, I got a letter from a politician mm -hmm. in Orange County who knew my parents, and he said, "You don't know me, you don't know know me, but I know your parents, and I can only imagine how disappointed they are in the choices you're making." This is after I did an episode of Seinfeld. What was, do you remember what the episode was? Yeah, so the um uh, the, the the name of the episode is the Fusilli Jerry, where they made it. A, a Jerry out of noodles. Or oh, okay. But it was the move episode where I stole Jerry's move and used it on Elaine. <laughs> right. So. And that was, that was your parents are going to be disappointed. Yeah. The politicians yeah. writing you this letter. So, so he must have been right. Cause the only other letter I got uh -huh. was a six page letter from my father <laughs> about how disappointed he was. <laughs> and, and, you know, because it didn't, you know, it didn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, refer to the whole episode uh, in regards to the sex act uh, with any sancti sanctimony or well, I, don't, I don't know. What sure. It, you know. Oh, yeah. But it's, I mean, it's fornication for the sake of fornication. That's not yeah. good. No, that's not good. So, you know, needless to say, over the years, when every single neighbor and friend in the world they've got is watching this show called Seinfeld, and they're like, <laughs> we love your son on Seinfeld. We love it. Eventually, right. they come on board, and then they're okay with Seinfeld, you know, right. even though... Um, maybe, you know, these characters aren't living up to the, their standards. Yeah. Um, no, they're, they're, you know, they're hardcore. At what point, I, growing up, it had to be difficult because I'm sure as a child, you did want their approval. Mm -hmm. When did you become okay with not having their approval? Um, it's it's a it's a constant process, I guess, where you just have to go, well, you know what, I, I, I this is, um, this is uh this is what this is what I do. This is what I'm okay with, mm -hmm. and it's not what they're okay with. But there, you know, there are certain <sighs> because they're your parents. It always does have an effect on you, whether you agree yeah. with them or not. You know, um, and and that can pull at you a little bit. But um, but it's made me look, you know, closer. It's it's so many things, including the religion in which I was grow grown up in. Right, um, you know. And, and, and both me and my wife and uh whereas we're like well we're not okay with this and we're not okay with this and and all that crap that you're you're brought up to believe are you just going to pick and choose what you want to believe you know all these things that get ingrained in your head and you're like when you get older you know what yeah i am going to pick and choose yeah because some of this makes no fucking sense at all right you know um and um you, you know and th there there have been times when um you know they've done or said things that which uh um well, I can't get into specific, but where they've actually said things to my own kids, you know, where I'm like, you know, mom, we don't believe, or dad, we don't believe that. Shit. And you've had to have that confrontation. Yeah, 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 we don't believe that. Yeah, and 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 don't send that garbage their way. 
Because you know what? It was actually hurtful with us. You know what I'm saying? We sur- I survived it barely. Yeah. You know, it's still, it's, you You're know, still working through I'm it. still working through this shit. And you but, don't have to watch your yeah. kids work through their shit. No. You, there's a generation no. removed now. Yeah. So. Wow. So do you still to this day get a script like Ted 2 and say like, oh boy, mom and dad are not yeah. going to be happy with this one. Uh, uh, like, do you know uh, that as soon as you oh, read yeah, it? But that, like just, that occurs to you instantly? Yeah, but that yeah. makes me smile now. Um <laughs> <laughs> It makes me giddy. Yeah. But uh, there's a, there's only been one time. There was one time. Um, there was one time where there was something in an episode of Family Guy, which wasn't even um, a scene that I was in, but, you know, Joe was in the episode. Mm-hmm. And it was so bad mm-hmm. that I actually said, look, just put that in another episode. I can't be in this episode. I can't be in this episode. What was it? I can't repeat it. It's okay. that bad. Wow. Yeah, it's that bad. But it was in an episode. Well, uh, they they said they pulled it, and maybe they would have put it in another one. Um, but it was it was so beyond blasphemous, um, gross, and it, and it just was one of those things where it's like, look, it's diminished returns here. I just said, you guys, you know, it's not funny, and it is just it's it's so so um, it's just it's so disrespectful to any Christian that ever walks the earth, you know, and it's not it's not. I get it. I, I, I've been a part of this show for 12 years now or 14 years. And I know, man, look, you've taken shots at the Catholics and Jews and everybody. And yeah. It's great. But this was, this was overboard and I can't, um, I can't, I can't even say what it was, but. And I think in comedy, you also have to look at the, uh, the, the reward and the cost. And it's like, you know, if it's going to be this disrespectful, it better be twice as funny. Yeah. And if it's less funny than it is shitty. Yeah then maybe it's not the greatest thing. Like you just said, it's not yeah. like you're taking this obscene moral high ground because you didn't have a problem with God yeah. masturbating in an right. easy boy. Yeah. Yeah, no, this, yeah. You know what I mean? No. So it couldn't have been. Yeah. Man. So what did they think of the tick? Oh, I think they liked the tick. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the tick is just the, fun. The tick's just fun. Yeah. The tick is your favorite yeah. character you've done. Is that right? Yeah. 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 It just, it's, you know, it's the most, um, uh, the tick is certainly the most eccentric, and creative and unique character yeah and you get to kind of flex no pun intended you get you get to flex creatively and do different things yeah so when you were doing putty for as long as you're doing it and i mean even to this day that's the best known thing you've done although Mm -hmm. you've been able to move on and actually do things that people know besides that did it get annoying that people expected you to not really have a personality to just be that sort of you know, yeah, but that's your, five. Yeah, yeah, that's your responsibility as an as an actor. You have to do you you have to get out there and sort of try to reinvent in one way or another. Um, uh, otherwise, um, if you just sort of capitalize on that, then you're it's it's going to be short short lived. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, was there after after Seinfeld was over? Was there any fear in you that? This is going to be the thing in my career now that the potty is so big. You know, before you started getting well, I was the, the sitcom doing nine you episodes got the, the of a, and, yeah sitcom and being in in a danger of being typecast. Right after that, yeah, I thought, well, that's not fair, but it that's what's happening. It seems, yeah, right, uh, or could potentially happen. So, um, you you know, it was briefly, and I don't know who it was that brought up. Uh, you know, potentially doing a putty spinoff back then at the time, you know, over at NBC, but that just was something that I wouldn't entertain. I just really, yeah, that's a ballsy move because that's an easy money move. Theoretically, you're going like, okay, Seinfeld is this thing that nobody was ready to end when it ended. Everybody wanted more. Putty's this beloved character. You know, I'm kind of selling out by doing it, but yeah, it is easy money, and it yeah. will probably be successful short term. It'll probably I'll probably at least get a season out of it and make yeah. a paycheck. Well, there was no pilot, Putty, uh, the life of Putty, or <laughs> there's nothing like that. Yeah, and I don't know who was testing the waters there. I just remember um, being being asked about it and just say, just say no, I'm, I'm not really interested in doing that, and I'm not really sure what it would, <laughs> you know, what what that would have been. I mean, yeah, how do you expand on that? How do you? I mean, he was a moron. Invest in it. It's just, you know, but we've never really had. I mean, yeah, there've been been shows where there were strong male characters who are just morons, you know, married with children, you right? Know, stuff like that. But he was still, you know, uh, I mean, Al Bundy was probably m- more multidimensional than he was. Much more multidimensional. Dave yeah, Buddy was, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was. 
but uh, <laughs> I, mean, I thought he was uh, special needs. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever get to save uh, props that you do stuff with? Like, do you, do you get stuff from the original Tick series? Do you have stuff that Putty used? Do you... I do have the t- original Tick suit. You do? You have the whole suit? Yeah, yeah. Does it still fit? Uh, I haven't put it on since uh, we did the show. That's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. No, it's for me, <laughs> probably listen, quite fortunate. I, I don't know. It's uh, it's uh, it would be a new one. Uh, you know, when we do, uh, you're Amazon, gonna you're redoing, or, re- or you're doing another. We're going to yeah. Amazon's got it, and uh, we're just waiting for them to greenlight Seth's latest version. Seth MacFarlane's doing it. Uh, no, uh, or uh, Seth Green. No, no, I'm sorry, uh, Ben Edlund's. Ben, Ed- okay. I'm sorry, we just went from Seth. To ben. Right, 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 right. Uh, I was about to say, whoa, yes. Ben's latest draft needs to get, uh, greenlight. but they are doing the show. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah. that's huge. Yeah. So, um, and Amazon is, 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 yeah. is big right now. You got to be happy with all the success that transparent mm-hmm. has had. Mm-hmm. Once you see that start happening, cause I yeah. feel like, you know, Netflix, when they had their series coming out, uh, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal until they had Orange is the New Black. And right. then it kind of explodes, and then everything that's on it gets attention. Right. I feel like that's happening with Amazon now because it's yeah. transparent. And that that's only going to equate to a yeah. lot more attention for the tick when it starts on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be – Amazon's a perfect home for it. It's going to be a little bit darker and – I would imagine yeah. the language is going to be more realistic. It's not you don't have to worry about network as much. Uh, true, but the tick, you know, I I thought the mo- when we did the you know, and it's an original incarnation there. Uh, the one thing that didn't ring true to me so much was in that pilot episode of the tick when he grabs that coffee machine, you know, because this poor fellow's put his fifty cents in and never got his coffee. <laughs> right, he shakes this machine, the coffee comes out, and the tick says, you know, uh. I don't know, Java devil or whatever. You are now my bitch. <laughs> right. And for the tick to say you're my bitch just didn't seem tickish to me because uh-huh. he's, he's incredibly, you know, ancient. I don't see him cussing, you know, or, or like if, if you were to, if you were to say anything like that. Well, it's always a moral high ground for the tick. It's yes. like he's doing what's right all the time. He might accidentally rip somebody's head off the bag. <laughs> right. But he's, you know, in his mind, when he's doing stuff, he's got the best possible intentions. Yes. And so I guess that's why he wouldn't curse. He's as Republican as superheroes. <laughs> yeah. Ever was. yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> he, he, he believes he's what he's doing is right for America. Yeah. Yes. And it's what the country needs yes. right now. Yes. Is the tick. Oh, my gosh. What about in in, uh, in your house? Like I, I was like, I asked the tick about Caitlyn Jenner and he said, he said, I would not judge Caitlyn Jenner until I've walked a mile in her Manila blinds. <laughs> right. Then you can say. <laughs> what about, what's the, what's the, the morality like in your house? Cause you said like in your home with your kids, do you get away from that religion completely? Uh, all our kids say prayers before meals, mm-hmm. you know, um, they're all spiritual and thoughtful and spiritual and they're still Catholic, mm-hmm. you know? It's just we don't go to church every Sunday. So that's what happened with, with my parents. They were both raised yeah. in very religious households, and my dad's father was a minister and the whole thing. Yeah. And once they finally escaped that sort of having the church over your head constantly, yeah. they did the same thing. They were like, you know, we'll go to church if you kids ever want to go to church. We'll tell you what you want to know. But there is yeah. no sort of pushing of any right. religion whatsoever. Because they saw what that did yeah. with them. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it's a smart move. Well, listen, I mean, you got a lot going on right now. Ted 2 is out on Friday. Mm. Mark Wahlberg, Patrick Warburton, everybody's in it. Everybody's back. And uh, everybody's back for Joe Dirt 2 as well. Mm. Joe Dirt 2 is on Crackle, though. Crackle, yeah. Yes. So you're you're yeah. you're hitting every media platform there is to hit. Oh. It's got to feel good. It does. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, it feels wonderful. It feels as a matter of fact. Uh, yes. Does that occur to you when you're when you're shooting a movie, filming a show, whatever it is? Now that there are so many vehicles for these things to live on, yeah. Does it occur to you while you're doing it where it's going, or when you're on the set, or you're just on a set? Uh, I don't think so because it, it, it uh, because people find it, and if it's worthwhile watching, you know, they'll find it. So it doesn't yeah. really matter. Um, and the tick was a good, you know. 
a good lesson of that mm-hmm. years ago we did nine episodes of a show that uh that the, the network never supported and right. they killed us before we were even on the air but there were nine episodes how'd they kill you before you were on the air well they they decided um it was just too expensive mm-hmm. and we were in the midst of of shooting and they're, they're doing reality TV now. They just discovered reality TV. That was so in the were, boom of, of yeah. cheap reality TV. Right, right, right. So they're doing a show called Joe Millionaire, which got huge viewership. It cost course. no money to make. They shot on video. It was an hour long. They didn't have to pay actors. It's just, you know, this is a, just a money-making venture for them. Yeah. And you've got the tick on the other end of the spectrum, which is a half-hour show. costs as much as an hour show. Single camera. Costumes. Over time. So yeah. it costs a lot. So... Well, you know, after we were in the midst of shooting or afterwards, and plus, you know, so, so there are those at the network that just didn't get it. Do they have to wear costumes? <laughs> That's, those are questions you're asking. <laughs> um, no, it's going to be the tick in jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah. So, so even though, I mean, we were supposed to be on Sunday nights. You right. Know, with like the Simpsons or Family Guy. So they set you up like, okay, we'll use what yeah. we filmed, but there's no part of us that wants this show to succeed beyond right. what we have. So what they did was they just held us for a year. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we got to put them on the air anyways. They put us on the air on Thursday nights against season two of Survivor, which was just the juggernaut. Of the course. It just, you know, they wanted to kill us and make sure that we didn't get decent numbers. But 14 years later, you know, um, you know, because it was clever and creative, you know, it's garnered a huge, you know, cult following of people that seem to like intellectual things, things that are, are different, you know? Yeah. You know, I always find that tick fans, you know, like, you know, are, you know, like things, you know, um, um, you know, the tick fans are the fans that, you know, would, you know, prefer, uh, you know, a Patton Oswalt stand up comedian or, you know, or Louis C.K. Totally. It's a very cerebral sort of. Cerebral sort. Yes. Yeah. I'm not even going to mention comics on the other end because I don't want to slam anybody. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you know? totally. Um, and so uh, it doesn't matter where the platform is and people find it now, you know. Yeah. If it's worthwhile. Well, fine. Do you have any idea when the tick is going to start on Amazon? I don't, you know, because we made this deal with Amazon a while ago and they've, uh, you know, um, they keep having notes for Ben, although I, I feel like he's at a great place with it. It's just, uh, it looks awesome to me. So, yeah. Um, and it, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll be a little bit of a scheduling, um, it's a slight scheduling headache since I'm doing another show for NBC right now. But sure. I didn't. I, I I only uh I only took that deal if they gave me a carve out to do the tick, which they did. Wow! So I'm hugely appreciative, and I love the NBC show. So um, it, yeah, it could be a, a good year. I still have four kids to put through college, so it's all right. I'm <laughs> right. busy right now. But. Yeah, and you can see Patrick Warburton on Crackle in Joe Dirt Two, and in theaters this Friday in Ted Two. Eventually on Amazon, all over the place. You can't miss the guy. You cannot miss him. Thanks for hanging out, man. Thanks, Sam. It was great talking to you. Great talking to you. And uh, we'll be back. A whole lot more Sam Roberts show still to come. I can't wait. Rob Zombie is making a Groucho Marx movie next. You know, he's made all every horror movie. He made the Halloween remake and House of a Thousand Corpses and all these movies. They announced this. They said uh, Rob Zombie is going to make a biopic about the end of Groucho Marx's life. Uh, And it's going to be based on a book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, which details the life of a young Marx Brothers fan who worked as the comedy luminary's personal secretary and archivist. That's what that word is, right? I don't know. I'm interested. They also, Rob Zombie was also supposed to do a, a movie about the, like, 1970s Philadelphia Flyers, I think. The uh, Broad Street Bullies. But that movie never happened. I I think he just made a horror movie, Rob Zombie. It's called 31. He was in here promoting it, about the crowdfunding it. I think he desperately wants to get out of the horror genre. I think he's got other interests, and he desperately wants to try. Well, big thanks to Patrick Warburton for coming in. Now, arguably an even bigger deal? I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to take that stance. But, tech, gadget, Guru, Today Show personality, CNN personality, Fox News personality, Sam Roberts Show regular, and visionary. Is that right? Katie Linendahl is here. <laughs> You're a visionary now? Hello, primetime. You got an award for being a visionary, correct? I did get an award. 
And is that Very because kind. I read somewhere that one of the qualifications for your visionary award was that you were on uh, Sam Roberts show bandwagon early on early and they said this chick is a visionary for seeing what is about to happen here i didn't like the golden state warriors for the last two years right i like them for the last maybe four because you're a visionary because i'm a visionary you see things five steps ahead your eyes are on where the puck's going (laughs) right that's correct and may i just add Yes, you may. It's a little bit of a digression, but Rob Zombie, House of a Thousand Corpses, Mm -hmm. best horror movie ever. Whoa. That has nothing to do with technology or gadgets, but I was just listening to you. See, you're trying to dip into the horror genre to get out of the tech stuff. Rob Zombie's going to show up on the Today Show. I'm staying strong on technology. Be like, look, new Tamagotchis are here. But you (laughs) and I did have a bond with, uh, I also interviewed Rob Zombie, and I was very scared. Yeah. Well, I have his logo tattooed on my arm, so uh, I was I was quivering like a girl. But bigger I've, fan than I am. Yeah, I've interviewed him a few times now, and we actually had a, a good interview last time. But yeah, I do wonder how it's going to go when he dips out of the horror genre. Because yeah, you could tell he wants to. First, he announced he was doing Broad Street Bullies. Then it didn't happen. Now he's announcing this Gro- Groucho Marx movie. He can't want to keep making scary movies. Well, that's funny. We talk about, what was it, Broad Street Bullies? Yes. That was a few years ago. And that's actually what I intended to interview him on. Right. But then all I did was talk about A House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> right. In because it's great. form. It's fantastic. Yeah. Captain Spaulding and all them. Do you think he can pull off non-horror? I don't know, man. Why don't you stick with what you're good at? Yeah, that's the thing. I'm not that's, trying to go into ballet. That's what I actually talked about after I saw The Rock's uh, Earthquake movie. I was like, it's the most predictable thing you've ever seen. There's nothing to it. They might as well not have written a script for it. But Dwayne The Rock Johnson has figured out exactly what his zone is. He's figured out exactly where his lane is. He's following the formula. And he's not one of these guys that's like, you know what? I've just I've done so much of it. I have to do something different. Here's my thing. I call that the Kelly Clarkson syndrome. Yeah? How so? She makes great songs about dissing dudes. Right. We all know that. Like Taylor Swift. But then, you know, they have these moments as artists or talent where they're like, I'm going to go do my thing. No, do what's working. Don't do it. Yeah. Go do that as a hobby. This isn't art. This is commercial. I love playing piano. Okay. I suck at it. Right. So you're not gonna... trying to make a job out of it. Sorry, Matt gonna... Lauer. Can't come in today. Got piano practice. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Voice lesson. Yeah, voice lesson. No. I'm going to stick with what I'm good at and passionate about and keep that as the hobby. You, here's the thing. If you're going to be passionate about something, you have to make sure you're good at it. Because you can't just, you can't be good at something and then follow your passion that's something else. Yeah. Because you'll fuck everything up. Right. It's not going to work. Like, you love volleyball. I love volleyball. (laughs) Mainly women's volleyball because the men Mm -hmm. are so much better than me. And you get to high five and hug after every point. Every point. You love volleyball. Bring it in, ladies. Bring Bring it it in. in. We're doing it today. Bring it in. But you know what happens? Huh. I get out there and I lose points and they yell at me. You got to spike that, fucker. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't win, so it's not something that I pursue. I go, you know what? I'm going to fall back on radio. This is my fallback mm-hmm. to my volleyball career. You're a professional journalist, Sam Roberts. And, quite frankly, a professional broadcaster as well. Absolutely. Kevin in Florida, welcome to Sam Roberts' show. Katie Linendahl is here. Prime time. Hey, uh, so much more Mr. For, uh, prime uh, time. Yes, sir. But I have to bring up the sequel. The Devil's Rejects is absolutely... A better movie than House of a Thousand Corpses. Saw that? Down, disagree. Saw that? Totes disagree. You do. Why? What, yeah, why is my question as well? I mean, do you want me to provide like a soliloquy as to why I subjectively thought that House of a Thousand Corpses was much scarier and much better in Dolby Digital Surround Sound? How, <laughs> Dolby Digital Surround Sound? Do I have to push my glasses up? It's like, uh, listen. You're talking about technicalities, though. I'm talking as a movie plot in general. Devil's Devil's Rejects was a much more realistic, much grittier movie. House of a Thousand Corpses was like creepy cartoony. You know what I'm saying? They were super different. If you're going to ask me, I mean, it depends on what mood you're in, but if I only could watch one forever, it would probably be Devil's Rejects. Listen, I just based the barometer on how many days I didn't sleep for Uh afterwards. And on a scale of like one to ten, it was like at least four days House of a Thousand Corpses. So that's where the win is. And Devil's Rejects was maybe one at most. Maybe 1.5. Here's the repeated. one thing I'm going to type in and I'll check out. But um, it, the reason that I think 
uh, Devil's Rejects is a better movie. That's something I can see happening more in real life easier. I think I think that's I think that's what it was. Like the scene when you're when they kidnap the family and they have him trapped in a motel and putting his gun in the woman's panties and all it just seemed really real and dirty and like frightening like holy shit there could really be some sick people. Whereas, you know, you pull over at the gas station, you go on the murder ride, there's a scary clown. That was almost an homage to other horror movies. I love them both, but Devil's Rejects is definitely more realistic. Perfect. See ya. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Boom. Well, Katie Lindelof. And we want to thank Patrick Warburton for stopping by. Um, I thought it was... Uh, I, I, I really didn't plan on spending a lot of time with him. I didn't know what I was going to talk to him about, but when we got into his parents... Uh, I could have talked about that for hours. My parents did the exact right thing. Yesterday was Father's Day. And I was like, I, you know, I very much appreciate you guys. You know, you gave me life, and now I have life. And we're all really thankful for that. Thank you, Katie. That didn't sound sarcastic, so I'll appreciate the compliment. Uh, but my dad did the right thing. He goes, yeah, we, Mom might make some sandwiches, so just come by whenever and pick up a sandwich and say hello. <laughs> That's what Father's Day was yesterday. It was come by whenever, and there'll be sandwiches, and you can pick one up and say hi. And I'm like, that's good. Because usually we all have to go over there, and then we sit outside the house, and my dad barbecues, and we have the same conversations we always have, and we make references to the same movies and Simpsons episodes we always reference. And it's, you know, it's me, my brother, and my sister. It's the same people. And then we have, and it takes hours, and it's the exact same night over and over again. And over again. What did you get him? Nothing. I, got, I mean, for sandwiches, I got him a card and some stuff from the bakery. That's good. He, he loved it. He was eating his pecan tarts right in front of me. You mailed it in with a card. No, no, no. I, I handed it to him. No, I'm saying... <laughs> <laughs> no, because he's like, don't worry about it. Just come over, pick up a sandwich. And I said, okay, I'll bring you some dessert as well. It's great. I'm a great son. I was... Uh, that's weak. What did you do for Father's Day? Uh, well. Well. Well, see, my family sounds a lot more exciting than yours. Because I love, I hang out with my parents probably more than my friends. They're awesome. They're cooler than I am. Huh. Yeah. That's not hard to believe. My dad's a badass. He's uh-huh. funny. He loves wrestling mm-hmm. and sports. So I, well, I got him tickets to WWE. Yeah. This weekend. So I'm going with Pops. Mm-hmm. That's wrestling. incredible. It's going to be fun. And I got him some technology, got him a new Bluetooth speaker and some headphones. Jesus. And... Which, by the way, you know, you kind of got the tech hookup, so that's not that different from me going to a bakery, but go on. Right. And then I got, him a, I got him a wrestling shirt. Okay. My dad doesn't have hobbies. Here's what my parents' hobbies are. My mom likes to sit down and talk about her book group. My dad likes to try to run our lives. That's their, that's their hobbies. Can I tell you, though, on birthdays and holidays, like Father's Day or Mother's Day, we yes. have an Excel spreadsheet in my family. And it's whoever you, you have to call first to win every year. And I'm, I'm very competitive with my three older sisters. What do you win? Self-pride. I would never win that contest. I don't even respond oh, to emails. 1201, I have, a, I have a time thing set on that. My iPhone goes off. I'm first out the gate. You call in the middle of the night? Absolutely. My parents are up, man. They're cool. <laughs> because you got to get on that Excel sheet. Yeah, right at the top. Did they put you? Did they keep you guys competitive when you were growing up? Um, about that. In general, I think I'm the most competitive. So you don't think your sisters are worried about that? Oh no, they are. They, they are. are. So they're they competitive. Ask where they fall on the list. So did they? Was that a natural thing, or were you raised like a competitive family? Like, no, when we. I think we're naturally competitive. Like, how many siblings? How many girls are there? Three girls. Older okay. girls. So it'd be like there's three girls. Plus you. Yes. So four girls were yes. making three dinners. Let's see who gets them. Did that ever happen? No. Okay, so not that competitive. But see, here's the, like, it's more like my sister was a West Pointer, right? Mm-hmm. It's a little badass. So yeah. it's like I was on a pull-up bar at 12. Okay. It was like, how many, how long is your is your mile time? But that was all like on you guys? Like, how did your sister become a West Pointer? Was she encouraged by your parents? Just a competitive family. Just naturally? Yes. Not like, when you were little kids, did they have you doing sports? Oh, every sport. Oh. But we didn't have us doing sports. We chose to do sports. Right. I was, and we were good at them. You were? Yes. I was made to do sports. I failed at t-ball. <laughs> you know what t-ball is? It's like baseball, except the ball is on a pole. <laughs> How do you like screw that up? I don't know. It's like striking out at, uh, uh, at bowling with gutter guards. Up. That's really bad. Yeah. Not striking out. 
not hitting any. Striking out's good in bowling. I failed at t-ball. I failed at soccer. Like, I had to sit down and be like, Dad, like, you don't have an athlete for a son. you got to be okay with this. you got to understand it. I'm never going to be good totally at sports. that's totally cool. You don't have to be great at sports. Yeah, you do. If there are girls around that are better than you, you should be good at sports. Mm. You think my dad was like happy about like, it? Like, how oh, okay. are you now? Like, did you terrible? Did you sp- okay, horrible. Now. Do I strike you as an athletic person? No. no, I am not good at anything athletic. I still would probably flunk at t-ball. I mean, I still race the person on the treadmill next to me. They don't know it. <laughs> right, you're just glancing over and seeing what the mileage is on it. And the speed, 100%. Good. Good. I mean, it's probably not good. It's probably driving you slowly insane. Probably. To be that competitive. Probably. I'm a competitive person, too, but not athletically, because that's not my field. In your mind. In my mind and in life. competitive. Yeah. I always try to make sure that my life is more fulfilling than other people's. And you know what that does? It makes it so my life is not fulfilling, because I'm always concentrating on somebody else. It doesn't Mm. work out that way. Mm. You can't do it. Smart, Sam. I know. I know. Smart. But, yeah, the the athletics, I would have to imagine that's why my dad just gave up and was like, yeah, just come over and get a sandwich. None of you are, I don't have the Manning brothers here. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't I, I don't have it. I, at one point when I was growing up, when I was like 13 or 14, my dad uh, decided he was going to put me on a calisthenics routine. And he spent a summer trying to get me to do exercises every day. He tried to make me do push-ups. He tried to make me, I don't know, do jumping jacks, jog in place. And my dad is not fucking... Jog in place. Yes. This my, sounds horrible. My dad, well, my dad is not Jack Lillane. Like, he's not Mr. Fitness. You know, so he doesn't know what he's doing either. Did you ever want to be like a wrestler, though? Since yes. I was so passionate? Yes, I wanted to be a wrestler. But I wasn't very coordinated. Ah. So I was probably... 12 or 13. What about like parkour? That seems like that would be up your alley. Freestyle walking? Freestyle walking. <laughs> yeah. I think I could, I think I could handle parkour. Not the advanced stuff, but I could definitely like, uh, jump when I take three steps. Uh huh. Sometimes when I'm walking upstairs, I'll skip every other step. Like I just skip them. So that's cool. Look at you. Yeah, yeah. So that's parkour. Look at you. But no, I always, I was always into nerdy stuff. It was always, I could watch TV better than people. I wasn't even good at video games. I was bad at video games, I'll tell too. you what you were good at, Sam Roberts. What? Weird tricks. Like what? Like bouncing a quarter off your ankle. Yeah, but I've talked about that before, too. I could bounce a quarter off my ankle, but then David Letterman... No, no, see, you always go for the negative. I'm right. going to let you finish. I'm, I'm going to let, let you finish. finish. Speaking of that, I want to talk about Taylor Swift, too. But... I tried to do it because I could flip quarter off my ankle, and I did that for Nickelodeon. And I've told this story before. I tried to get on David Letterman's show. David Letterman wanted me to aim it into something. I couldn't do it. And my dad <laughs> sat down with me for days and days. It was weeks. Every night he'd come home from work, and he'd take an ice cream dish down, and he'd put it on the floor, and he'd make me flip quarters into it. And I never hit it. And my ankle st- to this day has less power because you can't tone an ankle it's not a muscle no you cannot it's teach a bone that. you no. can't teach that and so now my ankles are less powerful i go to sleep but with why sore do you ankles have to focus on the, the negative on that like why couldn't you just leave it at hey i was on nickelodeon like that's awesome because then i know i know what happened next and i'm good enough next i failed at something <laughs> and so it should be brought to people's attention you know what i mean i'm an honest person i try to put it all on the table katie lindendahl that's fair I mean, I'm not sitting there winning awards. So this award, you went to San Francisco for this award? You just said it like it was like... San Francisco? Palau. You're singing the rice a song. <laughs> you went to San Francisco. You win this award. It's for uh, being a visionary? Yes. Yeah, so it was, it was actually a, a true honor. So it was the 18th an- annual Silicon Valley Forum Awards. Man. And there was four of us that were actually won this year. Mm-hmm. And I was presented along with... I, I, like here's the caliber of people. I, I, this isn't like a Caitlyn Jenner scenario. Like you actually deserve this award, right? <laughs> this wasn't like a thing where the tech community was like, "Oh, of course they're giving Katie a visionary award." 
No, it was actually pretty intimidating to be sitting next to the guy that invented the iPod. And what? And is the co-founder and Steve CEO. Jobs was sitting next to you? No. Zombie oh, Steve no. Jobs. <laughs> Who is now the co-founder and CEO of Nest, which of course oh. makes the smart thermostat. So it was just a, a very amazing, very talented group of individuals. And sometimes media gets nominated as well. So and that was, was you? Yes. And you were telling me like Bill Gates has won this award before? Bill Gates, Elon Musk. Who's Elon Musk? Tesla, SpaceX. Oh, yeah. that Elon Musk. I thought yeah, you meant another Elon Berlin. Musk. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's very impressive, Katie Lindendahl. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. So, here's what's going on with Taylor Swift. We went on a little bit of a tangent with me celebrating Katie Lindendahl and dipping back into my own self loathing. But, Taylor Swift, this is news is everywhere today. So, I was talking, actually, last time you were on, coincidentally enough was right after Apple announced this Apple Radio deal. And it's you know, it's the same deal as Spotify and all those other things where they're streaming music. And people are artists are already mad at Spotify because Spotify doesn't really pay the artists very well. I think it broke down to like something like you have to play a song two hundred times before you get the amount of money that you would for an iTunes download. I think it was it something like that? At last look, on average less than one cent per play. Wow. And you never play songs that much. Like Nobody plays a song 200 times. There's so many songs to play. So Taylor Swift is already off Spotify. So Apple kind of has a reputation for paying the artists more, obviously. And I would have thought that with this streaming thing they're doing, that Apple Music would still kind of support the artist. Um, as it turns out, Apple is giving three-month free trials of Apple Music to everybody. Like if you sign up for Apple Music, you get three months for free, and you can stream all the music you want, which means you can listen to pretty much every most of what's in the iTunes library. You can just listen to on your phone or your computer whenever you want for free. Uh, as it turns out, Apple Music will not be paying writers, producers, or artists for those three months during the free trial, is what Taylor Swift wrote in this open letter to Apple. She wrote, I find it shocking, disappointing, and completely unlike this historically progressive and generous company. Now, I get her point, and she's right. I guess she's she's saving uh, the music industry, but I've always kind of been annoyed at artists, music artists that are fighting for every, that are nickel and diming on their songs when really their songs can just act as a commercial to get them to live shows and, and buy merch and, and do everything else. It's always seemed like... That's why I, I didn't think these I thought these artists were foolish to fight Napster so much because at the end of the day you're exposing people to your music more, which most of these people are not just going to sit in their basement and listen to Napster. They're going to go out and they're going to see you. They're going to invest in your other projects. They're going to do what it is that they do. But Apple saw this open letter and immediately retracted from where they were and said. Uh, they tweeted out and said, hashtag Apple Music will pay artists for streaming, even during customers' free trial periods. That was from Eddie Q, Apple's senior vice president of Internet Software and Services. We hear you, Taylor Swift, and indie artists love Apple. So Taylor Swift is now getting credited with saving the music industry and stopping Apple, which has never happened before. I mean, Apple is notorious for saying our way or the highway, we've set this up, we've figured it out, this is the way, and that's how it's going to be from now on. Steve Jobs would walk around, dick in his hand, saying, no, you can't use your software on my delicious Macintosh computers. It's not going to happen. So I don't know if this is a matter of uh, Steve Jobs not being in charge anymore, but whoever in charge over there said, we don't want this PR, we kowtow. Apple. Like the notoriously giant company who invents everything. We kowtow, and we are bowing down to you, T-Swizzle. What did you think when you heard this, Katie? Well, I disagree with you in the sense, on several points. Whoa! I, <laughs> That's <surprise>. outrageous! <laughs> I think it's actually amazing on her part to 
use it as a like the power in her platform to be able to. I thought the letter she sent was was really well worded. She did. She's very good. This Taylor smart. Swift. She's got a smart team behind her too. She got a smart team, and she's very good at maintaining her niceness while still getting shit done. Most people, she doesn't come off like bitchy. She doesn't come off annoying. She doesn't come off mean. Why'd you have to be so mean? She doesn't come off mean. No. She comes off as like, I'm just doing this for the artists and my fans. Fearless. That's right. Now, I don't think Taylor Swift can still, if she's proving her business savvy to be this, I don't think she can make that, who, me, face when she wins awards anymore. But (laughs) she is, because she does, she doesn't come off mean in her letter. Go on, Katie. So I think it was actually, (laughs) I thought there was power in her making that statement, but I actually, I think. When there's times when you're saying it was kind of weak on Apple's part to kind of give in to this, yeah. I-, I disagree. Why? I think to actually give in to the power of the people is pretty powerful in itself. But Apple's never done that. It's okay. What do you mean it's okay? for everything. I guess, but that's not Apple. That's like everybody else. Like they're I not, think this is a much... Even when they fucked up Apple Maps, they were like, it's really not that bad. That's not true. They, they came out right and said it's not that great. Oh, but... For sure. And you know who, and was, when... you know who was not in charge then? When the whole antenna gate happened, too, they gave out free bumpers, they right. did that as well. They fucked up again. Was Steve Jobs around for antenna gate? He sure was. He was probably I covered fucking. covered that one like he a was, champion. He must have been fucking furious he at that sleep, one. sleep, breathe antenna gate, man. Yeah, he was mad about that one because Steve Jobs did not... Steve Jobs was not a stereotypical CEO. Steve Jobs did not like to admit he was well, wrong. Well, he didn't actually admit he was wrong, though. Remember <laughs> no. he serves me correct? He was like, you're all wrong, but here's a free bumper. Right. He was like, the problem is you guys are all holding your phones wrong. Right. Have a bumper. <laughs> and everybody's like, 25 bucks for free? Cool. Yeah, I guess I'll take the bumper. Take and I, it. I'll try to work on the way I hold my phone. But Steve Jobs, there's no way he'd be like, you know what? We've decided we were wrong and you were right, Taylor Swift. Not in a million years would he have done that. But I think the bigger, the underlying message here is these artists are getting screwed over in terms of play. And it didn't hit me until uh, one of my friends is a tour manager for a very, very popular artist. Whoa. Oh, excuse no, no, no. me, Katie Linendahl. I'm making a point. Little Miss Hollywood has uh-huh. arrived. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> point being. Right. When I started to hear the breakdown of revenue for services like Pandora and Spotify and how much of that revenue goes to the songwriter, then mm-hmm. to the artist, mm-hmm. then to the label. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I'm going to use an example from Aloe Black in 2014. His song was played 168 million times on Pandora. How much do you think he received? Seven hundred million dollars. Four thousand bucks. What? That's way less than he should have gotten. There's a big problem in how much they're earning per stream. But and I understand your point. How many? About, hold on. You're about right, Katie. merch. I was getting ahead of myself. In, like if, if you're going on tour, right? Yes. Well, first off, you're going to have to pay back your label to any publicity that they've been pitching out for you. The yes. music industry is very unique. Mm-hmm. But you're also, yes, making money on merch. You're making money on albums. It's all getting broken down. Really? You're paying out. But tell me this. If you're not a songwriter right. and you're an artist, you better be an artist and a songwriter at the yeah. same time to get bank. And not Miss uh, Kelly Clarkson, who's singing about God knows what now. Just sing about your boyfriends. But didn't songs used to get played thousands of times on the radio and artists would get no money? Isn't Pandora the new radio? Isn't Spotify the new radio? Isn't this just like the way music's evolving? Like this is the way young people listen to music. I think the argument there is if you're an indie artist that's trying to make pay and to get by, you're not making anything. If you're Taylor Swift and it's getting streamed one cent per stream, you're in a rack in millions. That's fine. And and you're big enough to be an artist to to make money elsewhere in sponsorships and endorsements, etc. If you're an indie person that's just getting a few streams here and there, you're in the red. That's why you got to stay, hang out after your shows, sign some CDs, and people will buy them if you sign them, right? It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's never enough for you, Katie. Let's go to Nate in West Hollywood. Nate, welcome to Sam Roberts Show. Hey, how's it going? Good. Good. Actually, um, she just made uh, the exact point that I was calling about. Um, you know, w- with uh, Spotify and like all the streaming services. You still get paid whatever your your uh, your royalty is, you know, just because like you're signed to a big label. Um, so who's know, taking the money? Whatever. Is Spotify taking the money or is the label taking the money? Oh no, it's, yeah, it's Spotify it's, still still pays out seventy percent to the label, and then the uh, 
same uh, deal as iTunes. And then um, whatever your deal is with your label, you're going to get paid accordingly. So 866... Okay, sorry, Nate. Thanks, buddy. 866-969-1969 if you want to call in. That's the thing. I think a lot of times these labels are taking a ton of cash, too. Now, I don't think an indie band is making money streaming music, but I also don't think an indie band back in the day would have access to the amount of ears that they get, whether it's on Sirius XM or Spotify or what have you. And, you know, I, I think this is just a new form of radio for them, meaning they can actually get their songs heard. There used to be an intrinsic value to just having your shit heard. When I find out that there's a Sam Roberts show on YouTube, Sirius XM is probably pissed off because they're like, that's our number one priority is Sam Roberts show. That's the, the only thing we care about. But for me... I'm going, more listeners, the better. If they listen to it on YouTube, they're probably going to want to subscribe so they can hear live. And even if they don't, they're going to get involved in other stuff that I'm doing. There is a currency to having an audience. And there used to be a thing where an indie band would just freak out being on the radio. Like, oh shit, we're on the radio. We can finally get people to hear our music. So isn't... The streaming services and all that, isn't this just, okay, now you can hear our music, you don't have to invest 99 cents and buy it on iTunes, we can f- figure out a way to get to you, you can look up our name, you can listen to our music for free, and the fact that we're getting anything is more than we used to get on radio. But in talking about currency, it needs to, the point needs to be made that how much less you're making off of a stream as opposed to an iTunes download. Right. That's, significant. It is significant. That's why, and and you know what? I think that's the real difference. And the direction that things are going, where everybody's now on Spotify, everybody's right. going to be on iTunes Radio. Right. So why do you need to buy that album? Right. I think that's the you real. Used to buy the whole album, by the way. Now you just buy the song. Right. Now you're just listening to it on Spotify. I think the huge difference is that on the radio, you couldn't. It wasn't on demand. Meaning you just listen to the radio, you'd hear the song once, and if you wanted to hear it over and over and over again, you'd have to buy the album. Now to hear it over and over again, you can go to your radio and just keep listening to the same song. And I guess that means you don't have to buy it on iTunes. I, I feel like a better deal needs to be worked out. And I think this it serves as an example of a good first start. The Taylor Swift deal. Yes. Yeah. I mean... It, it brings at least a, it brings awareness to it, not to be nerdy. It does bring awareness. If you look at the infographic of how much you're making per stream, mm-hmm. it's kind of it's kind of sad. Yeah, it, it just really depends because I still I still look at it like okay, radios people Less didn't than get paid one for radio cent per play. People didn't get paid for radio, but they use radio to get you out to the show to buy it, whatever it was. You're saying now because nobody buys albums anymore, that needs to be put into the stream. With streaming becoming because so streaming much more becomes popular. buying the album and listening to the radio in one. Mm-hmm. Mm. Franny, you're on Sam Roberts show. Well, yeah, and you just said exactly what I was saying. I mean, back then when it was just radio, um, and that was like all exciting, getting your voice out there. Um, the whole excitement was because then all these people are going to buy my album. But who does that? But now? don't don't you think like this? Don't you think musicians need to realize that technology is changing, the way people's listening habits are changing, and the business is changing, and the money is not in making albums. You're not going to get paid for the music you make. You're going to get paid for other stuff. So figure out a way to adapt. Adapt and and overcome. to figure out another way for them to make money, because when I heard that, uh, what was the other one? It's not the Apple... um one, but the other one that like Jay Z and uh, Beyonce. Oh, stupid! And, uh, 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 yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, title, and it title. Came out, but whatever, and however much it was going to cost per month, and like all these like billionaires, I don't know, know how much they're worth, are like getting their pants all pissy just because um, they're not getting paid for some. Like that, that's just crazy. You guys yeah. are multimillionaires. I get what you're saying more with like the indie artists, and to that problem, I don't have a resolution. But for all these like like Jay-Z and all them, to get all, like, pissy for um, 20 bucks a month. I'm like, I'm not paying 20 bucks a month to, like, basically what you're saying, listen to the radio. Yeah, and it's, and it's, and people need to realize that content creators need to figure out new ways. Am I sitting here and saying to myself, well, I'm 30 years old, you know, for the next 20 years, I'm just going to have this radio show and that's how I'm going to make my living. Fuck no! 
You think I don't see this as a dying industry? I see it. I'm the last one. There's no more professional broadcasters after Sam Roberts. It's just me. I'm supporting the industry from the bottom of it. You know, there's still some power players involved. But once those power players go, there's me and there's no one else. So... I'm constantly aware of that, and I'm looking at ways to uh, uh, create revenue for myself, to further my career, to realize that this traditional thing that's been there for so long, it's like when Howard Stern came out and said, podcasting doesn't work, you got to go to a small market. People tell me to go to small market radio stations and build a following that way, and I'm like, it's not 1985. That doesn't work anymore. You know who's on small market radio stations? The same people that are on big market radio stations. They're just recorded and sent out to other stations. It doesn't work anymore. The industry's changed. So I, as a performer and as a talent, Words need to adapt. Loosely. <laughs> need to adapt. I need to adapt and figure out new ways to do things. That's what musical artists need to do. They need to adapt and figure out new ways to make money. Because the content, the song, just because it's always been one way doesn't mean it's always going to continue to be one way. And people need to realize, should they just give everything away for free? I don't know. That's everybody's individual choice. But you can't nickel and dime on the songs. you got to have the songs nowadays they just have to be the welcoming point to however else you're actually going to make money that's why podcasters are out there doing live shows podcasters do live shows so they can sell tickets so they can make money because they're giving away their podcast for free should people who podcast should mark Merritt mark Merritt's got obama on his podcast this week he's giving it away for free it's content he's creating it you know should it be free no it's he's an artist but that's the industry you give away the content for free, and then you go and you pay a ticket to see Mark Maron, or you buy his book, or you do whatever you have to do. Taylor Swift is doing fine giving away her music for free. Indie artists coming up now need to figure out how to make money outside of just creating music. That's the way of the future. Like You have to do that now because you're, you're hanging on for dear life now. This Taylor Swift thing worked today, but it's not going to continue to work because it's just done. People aren't going to pay real money for music anymore. It's just not going to happen anymore. What are you calling about? Boom! Jeez, that was like a... F- Should we slow clap that? I feel like... I feel I like... I think this is going to be an ongoing debate for uh, years. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think... I don't even know how long it's going to be because I don't think it's going to be in short order that people are lucky to get anything for content. It's just the way it is. You know, it's just... It's, it's, it's the way it is right now. Brad, you're on Sam Roberts' show. Oh, hey. How's it going, Sam? Good, pal. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say it's always ironic how it's always like the rich asshole artists who are always complaining about they're not making enough yeah. money off. Of you know what happens? Money. You know what happens with the indie artists? The indie artists figure out how to survive if they're really good. They figure out how to survive if they want to do this for a living. They figure it out. They go, okay. You know, we're not selling records like we used to. Nobody's buying CDs. So let's put them on a thumb drive and sell them at our shows. Let's pose for pictures with people. Let's make cool fucking t-shirts. Let's make the coolest t-shirt of any band, and people will start buying our t-shirts. Let's create some kind of buzz about us so people have to go to their local spot to see us in concert. They figure out something to bring money in because you can't you can't be traditional in a non-traditional world, Brad. Woo, Sam Roberts oh, is quotable today. Wow. Boom. Some, I know that uh, there's some artists that have given up on selling music. Uh, in some cases in general. I mean, Nine Inch Nails about, what, six, seven years ago gave away an album for, you know, whatever you wanted to pay for it. Yeah, and by the way, the Trent Reznor was one of the fucking assholes who was rallying against Napster when Napster yeah. came out. And then he realized, oh, shit, I was wrong. Yeah, it's ironic. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Mike in Colorado. What's up, Mike? How's it going, guys? Fabulously. So, two things. First thing is, I heard Kid Rock in an interview with Howard Stern discussing that selling music is not how you make money in the music industry anymore anyway. Thank God. The only way to make money is to to tour and to make money that way, which I agree with. Tour, get your fucking shit on a commercial. Get on a commercial. Do something. Get on a soundtrack. Anya Marina, who comes up here, she's an independent artist. She's crowdsourcing or crowdfunding her next album, which is totally cool by me. You got to make money somehow. And she's made a ton of money being on like the Twilight soundtrack and all that stuff, you know, figuring right. it out. Like that, those moves are not sellout moves anymore. They were at and one point, it, but they're not anymore. It's possible that if, if, for me, 
specifically, if I can pay $10 a month or whatever it's going to be with Apple Music to stream whatever is on iTunes that I can stream, there's probably a lot more stuff I would stream than I would have bought anyway. So I, think that's I feel right. like more people are going to stream music that they would not have purchased. I think that's right. It creates more streams, which creates more money than... And hopefully, you know, hopefully, if you find a band that you're streaming all the time, you find a way to invest in that band. I would hope that people do well, that. Exactly. And I, I think that people are still going to be able to buy the music that they feel like they should buy, but if I can stream everything that I would ever want to listen to for $10 a month, I don't see why that'd be a problem. And I feel like a lot of these artists are going to be members of these streaming services as well. And I'm going to tell you this. Katie Linendahl showed up here in an adorable dress full of little guitars. Yeah, time appropriate. <laughs> yeah. I, I like your point about these artists that are like, oh, I'm not selling out and I'm not doing like... If I'm going to be Lady Annabelle, I'm going to do that iced tea commercial. Yes. You take the revenue. Right, you have to now. That's I think that's that's the way things are moving. It's like, okay, you're not making money the way you were before off albums, but also... People are not, yeah, nobody's calling you a sellout for being in an ST commercial. No. Nobody's calling you a sellout for jumping on a movie soundtrack. There used to be, like, even up to the 90s, like a rock band, Nirvana, could not pop up in a fucking Pepsi commercial. It couldn't happen. Now that doesn't exist for, there's no band that you can't be in a commercial, except a stupid band. Hey. Hey. Katie Lindahl, you are an absolute joy. An absolute joy to be around. Oh, right back at you, prime time. People, I want you all. Oh, Paul's pointing at the phone screen. He really wants me to take this call. <laughs> I'm going to plug Katie while Lady Di has literally been on the hole for the whole the entire two hours of this show. She has. Die. Die. Yeah, I'm right here. No, I'm asking you to. Do you have a question for Katie? Um. Yeah, Katie. How you doing? Are you a pretty good? <laughs> Tell her, Katie. You can say yes. Ratchet. <laughs> okay. She is. She's kind of oh. ratchet. Ratchet. No, 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 no. No, that's okay. All right. Thank goodbye, you. Lady Di. All right. That's, that's enough. That's all she got? That's, yeah, she's, it's enough. She that was nothing. the biggest. You just wasted. If you that wanna, was ridiculous, Sam. If you want to get the answer. That's it? That's it. If you want to get the she, answer. She was on hold for an hour and a half. Two hours. Two hours. That's it. That's it. If you want to find out the answer to Lady Di's question yourself, you can follow us on Twitter at SRShowSXM. we got pictures of everything that goes on in the studio. You can also follow the wonderful Katie Linendahl on Twitter at Katie Linendahl, on Instagram at Katie Linendahl, on Facebook at Katie Linendahl. And I'm going to tell you something about this broad. She is a visionary. All right? And that's been documented. Paul, step over there. Because that mic won't work on this thing. Paul, Paul, Paul. Paul, Katie, has something to read for us. It's called The List. Go ahead, Paul. Lady Di was on hold for two hours. Sam is working on a movie script for a dog that has cancer. <laughs> Patrick Warburton's dad was mad at him for a family guy having God masturbate. Patrick Warburton's mother wanted him to sit through two decades of rosaries. Super Fudge made Sam cry. <laughs> Patrick Warburton still has a tick costume. Uh, Sam says happy Father's Day with a sandwich. He failed at T-ball. <laughs> Sam's dad is not Mr. Fitness. <laughs> Taylor Swift saved music industry with a letter, and it's not 1985 anymore. No, it is not 1985. Katie, what did you think of that? Paul, where was my line, dude? Give Katie some credit, Paul. Give Add to the a- list. Anything. Add to the list. No, get back on that mic. Yeah, yeah. Get back. Put a Katie thing on the list. And Katie Landendahl is a visionary. She yes. is. Why wouldn't you say that so people know? Yeah. Paul, thank you Good for job, the list. Paul. Katie, thank you for being here as always. Good times. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. I don't know who's coming in tomorrow. Maybe uh, maybe Taylor Stryker? We'll see. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm definitely going to play that Rachel Dolezal song tomorrow. I promise you that. That's saving the music industry. Rachel Dolezal. We'll see you then. Goodbye, everybody.